starts at 12. The Night Beat starts right now. San Antonio firefighters are calling a home on the south side a total law. That's right. They got the call for the blaze in the early hours of the morning. The night team's John Paul Barajas spoke to a man who lives on the property about how he and four others escaped. Flames engulfed a home on the 2700 block of Nueces Street around 2 a.m. As firefighters extinguished it, all you could see is a wall of smoke where the walls of the home once stood and lights from firefighters' helmets. Before the blaze ignited again, firefighters able to put it out once more. Now all that remains is memories and charred belongings. We got out the window. All of you got out from this window? From one of the windows we have inside, it had an air conditioning unit, and that's where we got out. Ignacio Rojas and four other adults live in the house next door, but on the same property to the one that burned down. He explains they were dead asleep when his friend woke up to the smell of smoke. The fire came this way. There's the gas. There's everything. It would have burned us. Luckily, no one was injured, and according to the San Antonio Fire Department, no one was inside the home at the time because it had been converted into an office and storage space. Firefighters say the home is destroyed, but they were able to stop the flames from spreading. The backyard neighbor is more than thankful. Saludo a todos los bomberos de San Antonio y que le sigan trabajando así como trabajaron en la noche. Es un orgullo tener bomberos. Right now, the San Antonio Fire Department is still investigating the cause of that fire, and I was able to speak to one of the sons of the property owner. He says even though the, ho the home was a total loss and completely destroyed, he's counting his blessings because his family is still intact. John Paul Barajas, KSAT 12 News. John Paul, thank you. Another fire leading off today's other top stories. Arson investigators trying to figure out how flames started at a vacant home on the west side, west of downtown. This was the scene around 1045 last night near North Brazos Street and West Salinas. Firefighters on scene tell us the fire started outside the back of the home. Damages were minimal and we're told no one was hurt. Police say they're trying to piece together what led to a man being shot in the head while sitting on his balcony overnight. It happened after 10 p.m. at an apartment complex off Jackson Keller, not far from Blanco Road and Loop 410 on the north side. A witness told police he was on his balcony when he heard another man talking and then shortly afterward heard several gunshots. The victim was taken to University Hospital in serious condition. Police say they found several shell casings in a partially loaded pistol magazine in a nearby roadway. No arrests have been made. To a lighter story now, today San Antonio police got a chance to show the West Side community a different side during a community engagement block party event. Church, or, church organizers that put on the event said that it was a way to break down stereotypes associated with both the community and law enforcement. They tell me bridging the gap is important now more than ever. It brings joy to me because now they're seeing the, the officers as human beings and for who they are. The Harper's Chapel Baptist Church put on what they hope is the first of many community engagement events with San Antonio police on their campus today. There, people young and old got a chance to experience music, good food, games, and just genuine conversation along plain clothed officers with the department's community engagement unit. Well, we see excitement in the kids' faces when they, when they find out we're police officers. A lot of them say, I want to be a police officer, sir, so so uh, we're excited to be out here and see that. Pastor Vincent Robinson says having this interaction with officers, especially on the west side, is critical. They struggle just like we do. Uh, they have issues just like we do. But if we're not going to sit down and talk about the problems, if we're not going to sit down and educate one another and be able to come to agree to disagree, we're never going to move forward. It feels good to be able to give back and be a part of the solution when it comes to uh, giving our young people an understanding of, of, of what a police officer is. And, and, and exactly what they do. Officer Ron Brown says he is thankful police and community engagement in San Antonio is strong. Residents and attendants agree. They're here to help in whatever capacity they can. We should have more love for each other. This helps build relationships not only with the church, but also with uh, the police department. And uh, that's what really transforms community is good relationships. The church says the plan is to eventually make this community engagement block party an annual event. In the meantime, they're planning another event September 18th at the West End Park with the San Antonio Police Association. 
On what would be her 75th birthday, the family of Pauline Diaz is keeping her memory alive. She was last seen 10 years ago walking in the parking lot of the HEB on Southeast Military in Goliad after her shift ended. Her family says the investigation into her disappearance is ongoing but slow. Her daughter Juanita reflecting on the past decade without her mom. We've had so many celebrations, new things in our family that has happened that it hurts me that she was taken away and not being able to see these new joys that have come to our lives. The family says there was an anonymous tip given to police earlier this year about a possible location of her body, but that tip didn't lead anywhere. A $25,000 reward is being offered for any tips that could lead to Pauline Diaz. Those with information are encouraged to contact police. As we were standing there with the uh, detention officer, he said uh, he was glad to shoot him. You can't judge me. It felt good to do what he did, and then he had to do something to get someone to listen. The state has rested its case in the capital murder trial of Otis McCain, but testimony is set to resume on Monday. McCain accused of murdering SAPD detective Benjamin Marconi. You can catch up on the past two weeks and follow along with our live stream when court resumes at KSAT.com or on our KSAT TV app. Outside with live camp tonight. Hope your weekend got off to a great start today. I hope you were able to find a cool place to hang out this afternoon because it was certainly a hot one. Still warm at this hour. A lot of us still have temperature readings in the 80s and it's a bit hard to tell at this hour, but you may have noticed things looked a little bit hazy today. We did have a little bit of Saharan dust around and some of that will linger over the next couple of days. So coming up, I'm going to show you that Saharan dust outlook, what it could mean for the rest of the weekend. We'll talk in detail about your Sunday fun day forecast and chat be briefly about our next low chance of rain. Nothing to get too excited about all that and more coming up in a bit. Samuel. All right. Very much. The Briscoe Western Art Museum is making sure the region's pioneer heritage and cowboy culture is preserved. And since today is National Day of the Cowboy, the night team's Jonathan Coto tells us how the Briscoe celebrated. Pan de campo, frijoles de olla, and peach cobbler. Some of the historic treats staff at the Briscoe Museum of Western Art whipped up for today's National Day of the Cowboy event, a celebration of all things cowboy in a city with a rich cowboy past. So we've been celebrating National Day of the Cowboy here in San Antonio since 2015, but the day was actually uh, first celebrated in Cheyenne, Wyoming in 2005. The museum's effort of preserving the region's cowboy culture had to be canceled last year due to the pandemic. Jackson says that just made them more excited to celebrate cowboy culture this time around. What we did is we created National Day of the Cowboy saddle packs, activity boxes for kiddos, and we were able to push that out to over 800 children for that day. So we still celebrated National Day of the Cowboy. We just weren't all together doing it. Now it wouldn't be National Day of the Cowboy if it wasn't for that glorified flat brisket <laughs> called Pande Campo. Let's let's try it out. Hmm. And I can certainly see why it's glorified. The event includes a roping cowboy, a look into the history of the Hollywood Western from the late 1960s through the 1980s, highlighting John Wayne, the Duke himself. And a cowboy day even had a cow as part of a Southwest Dairy Farm demo. Jonathan Cotto, KSAT 12 News. And tomorrow on Good Morning San Antonio, we'll be talking with Mayor Ron Nirenberg as part of Leading Essay at 8 a.m. The mayor is fresh off his trip to D.C. to advocate for more funding for San Antonio infrastructure. If you have anything you'd like to see discussed or questions you want answered, you can submit them right now at KSET.com. The U.S. has reached its highest weekly total of reported COVID-19 infections in months. This as hospital beds fill up again. The latest when the night beat continues. The U.S. now recording more than 43,000 COVID cases per day. That's up nearly 51% in the past week and more than three times the number in late June. In Japanese states where vaccination rates are the lowest are getting hit the hardest by this latest surge. ABC's Ty Hernandez tells us about the impact on patients and those who care for them. 
Hospitals across the country are once again filling up with COVID patients. Admissions jumping nearly 36 percent this week. 306,000 Americans infected, the nation's highest weekly total in months. Florida seeing more than 10,000 cases a day. And now concerns that Miami's Rolling Loud Music Festival this weekend could become a super spreader event. Nurses on the front lines say with the Delta variant, this latest surge is different. I have not personally taken care of one patient that I have gotten to remove the ventilator from and they succeed and get to move out of our unit. Nationwide, more than 66 percent of the eligible population, those 12 and over, have received at least one vaccine dose. More than 57 percent are fully vaccinated. Many are still hesitant, but some doctors say they are starting to see attitudes toward vaccines change. All the patients who are hospitalized here upon recovery, you'd have changed their mind and would get vaccinated once they are discharged. In Arkansas, Tate Ezzy and his pregnant wife are both unvaccinated, and they both ended up hospitalized with COVID. She lost the baby. I do want to just tell my story because it could happen to me. It could happen to anybody. And now there are new questions about the possibility of vaccine booster shots. The New York Times reporting senior health officials believe a third shot may be necessary for the immunocompromised or those over 65 who received Pfizer or Moderna vaccines. The CDC has said it's exploring multiple options, but notes more evidence is needed. Ty Hernandez, ABC News, New York. Well, to weather now, and I'm glad the rain is gone, but this haze and yeah. humidity is not yeah. fun. I'm just over here apologizing to him because I'm <laughs> sniffling, I'm coughing, I'm just all type of unattractive up here. So <laughs> it's because that dust. <laughs> you're, you're not alone. Yeah, we had the dust yesterday. Mold was very high, so a double whammy yesterday. Thankfully, today the mold count came down a bit, um, but that Saharan dust may still be bothering you today. We did have a plume move in yesterday. It continued to move north through the state today and this plume is not particularly dense but it is noticeable especially when you look toward the horizon our sky is just not that uh, vibrant blue that we typically see uh, we're going to continue to see this plume filter in and out tomorrow even into monday so we're going to have a little bit of lingering light saharan dust for the next couple of days but i suspect by tuesday uh, we'll get that brighter blue color back to the sky so just keep that in mind for the next couple of days currently at the airport clear skies once those clouds cleared out this morning it was clear for the rest of the day. 82 our air temperature and our dew point is in the low 70s. For some of us, dew points fell off a little bit this afternoon, but uh, really not by much. And with that elevated dew point, we're still pulling a heat index of 86 at this hour. Air temperature out in Del Rio is still in the low 90s, 93. It's 82 in Rock Springs, 84 in Pleasanton. And even with dew points falling off a little bit this afternoon, they're starting to come back up tonight. And for everyone, they'll be high through tomorrow morning. So uh, we've got a mix of 60s and 70s, even low 80s. Bevo, I think that's a little bit high for you right now. Your sensor always reads the dew point a little bit higher than it actually is, but you get the idea. We've got a lot of humidity out there tonight. Winds are off the Gulf of Mexico out of the southeast at about 5 to 15 miles per hour. Not quite as breezy as it was at points this afternoon, uh, but we held on to a decent breeze this evening, and that certainly always helps us out. Overnight, though, winds will become light right around 5 miles per hour for most of us. And we are going to pull some morning clouds back in through the overnight hours. Not for everyone. Really, these low clouds are going to be focused along the I-35 corridor and then up to the northwest across portions of the hill country. So not everyone looking at a cloudy start tomorrow morning, but a lot of us will be, including in and around San Antonio. Temperatures mid to upper 70s, but just like today, a couple hours of those morning clouds and then they will be gone very quickly, leading to abundant sunshine again tomorrow. And that does mean it's going to be another very toasty day. Air temperatures uh, mid to upper 90s, even some triple digits off to the south and to the west. And the majority of us are looking at another day with heat indices or feels like temperatures up near 100, even a few degrees above 100 tomorrow afternoon. So if you've got more outdoor plans for your Sunday, keep the water and 
the sunscreen very close by. Elsewhere across Texas today, high of 99 in Dallas, high of 101 in San Angelo and 95 up in Lubbock and Amarillo. Rainfall wise, very, very quiet day. Even tonight, things are pretty quiet. What you're seeing here from Dallas down to San Antonio, that's some ground radar clutter, so there's no rain out there. A couple of showers near the Big Bend region up a little bit closer to El Paso. Reason why it was so hot and just almost perfectly sunny across a good portion of Texas today, including here at home, is because we've got a mid-level upper a high pressure system. It's kind of like a mini heat high. It just keeps us hot, dry, and rain free. That'll be around tomorrow, but by Monday, early next week, it's going to be suppressed off to the west ever so slightly, and that's going to open the door for a few very, very weak rain making disturbances to move in overhead. Uh, and when I say weak, I mean very weak, not going to provide a whole lot of lift for us through Wednesday and Thursday of next week. So that's why our rain chances are so low as we get into Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday. I can't rule out a little bit of rain on radar, but it's not going to be anything widespread and uh, for most of us, we're not going to see much rain over the next seven days at all. That includes your Sunday. Another hot day tomorrow. Some of that lingering light Saharan dust will create a little bit of a haze. Otherwise, hot tomorrow, high of 94 with the heat index up closer to 100 degrees. There is a disturbance out in the Atlantic Basin in the in the tropics. We'll talk about that coming up next half hour. Guys. Needless to say, stay hydrated. huh? Kate? Yes. All right. Thank you. Uh -huh. Well, coming up next in sports, Larry, the Cowboys and their fans hoping for a different result this year. Yeah, I mean, they've been hoping uh, since, what, 1995, I think it was the last time they won a Super Bowl. So the Cowboys fans, they've been hoping for a very long time. Well, there is renewed hope that this season is the season. And speaking of those fans, they packed the stands big time today for opening ceremonies. We are live from Oxnard with more coming up. This is inspirational, particularly now, uh, after us all feeling what it was like not to have training camp, not to have this kind of contact with our fans. Cowboys owner Jerry Jones continues to be emotional on the Cowboys return to California as we go camping with KSAT. Camping with KSAT, powered by Davis Law Firm. Check out the crowd that poured into the Cowboys training camp in Oxnard today after COVID-19 shut it down last season. Crazy. Cowboys super fan was there to share in the moment. Uh, enjoyment of the packed house with standing room only along the fence line to welcome the Cowboys back. Cowboys cheerleaders put on a show and the mayor of Oxnard presented Jerry Jones a trophy he used to practice like he was hoisting the Vince Lombardi trophy. Something the Cowboys haven't won in 25 years, but now there's renewed hope. With more on that, let's take you live to California where Greg Simmons is ready to talk. You know, Larry, the reason for the renewed hope here is the fact that they're getting a lot of the injured players back, especially on offense. Dak Prescott, their star quarterback, Tyron Smith, Leo Collins, Zach Martin on the offensive line, and it tied in, of uh, course, uh, Blake Jarwin. And you combine that with the young players who already made a name for themselves in their first year, like C.D. Lamb, and can understand the renewed optimism. I plan on bringing a lot of, you know, Electric plays, uh, a boost of energy to the offense, and uh, you know, overall just competitiveness. Wow, that's something to say after second-year wide receiver CeeDee Lamb gave us in his first season wearing the star. 935 yards on 74 receptions with five touchdowns and another TD on the ground. And that was mainly as a slot receiver. Now with Amari Cooper on the men, CD is getting a lot more reps outside. <laughs> You know, the outside is, is kind of where I started in college, so like just being back out there felt kind of natural. You know, and uh, by Coop, unfortunate, you know, him not being here for the training camp, it kind of helped me, you know, build a boost of confidence uh, just, to, just to go out there and play and compete at a high level, just understanding the plays and understanding what we're trying to do here. So it's, 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 it's fun. Go Cowboys! Go Cowboys! What's even more fun is Lamb's experience in Oxnard after they were not allowed to come to California his rookie season and before a packed house. This is my first time actually seeing something like this, so it was actually nice. You know, I enjoyed the the, the, the fans coming out here and, you know, giving us a, the love and support, and uh, you can definitely feel the energy in the air, and, uh, you know, it just gets you excited for the season. And Lamb gave the fans something to cheer about when he was able to haul in Dak Prescott's pass with just one hand against another rookie sensation, Trayvon Diggs. 
Me and T Days, we gon' we gonna compete always, and uh, we came in together. So you know, we hold each other to a high standard, and uh, he got me on the first one. So I had no choice but to let him hit a little bit. And just think how much better Lamb's first season in the Cowboys uniform would have been if Dak had been healthy. Great to have him back. You know, it's like feels like I don't know, kind of a because he understands everything that's going on, and he makes it a lot easier on me. Just ball placement and everything and uh you know just getting in and out of huddle he kind of just give you that energy that that vibe that that era if you will and uh yeah he's great to have him back man but now for the most important question what does a former sooner think of ou in texas going to the sec oh man i wish they'd have did that when i was there truly and honestly but i'm proud of, I'm, I'm proud of the jump that they're doing and i uh, can't wait to see them next year it's a change you know you kept hearing a lot about the big 12 and bashing the big 12 so now we're in the sec it's only it's only good to see what's going to happen now all right, now the players do have another practice tomorrow in front of a crowd, and at the same time, they know they are, have a full day off on Monday. With this warning from the NFL, any unvaccinated player violates protocols, they'll face a $15,000 fine. Let that be known before they go out on Sunday night. Again, one more practice tomorrow, and of course, don't forget, we'll see you tomorrow night on Instant Replay with Cowboys owner Jerry Jones. Live from California, Greg Simmons, KSAT 12 Sports. Thank you, Greg. And later in sports, the Big 12 is thinking big as they try to keep Texas and Oklahoma from leaving the conference. Yeah, that's definitely the talk <laughs> of sports it right now. It is indeed, now. right? Dominating. Cowboys, right. Cowboys camp and whether Texas and Oklahoma actually are going to make the move. Yep. So we'll love to hear what they have to say coming up. <laughs> Coming up next, the Tokyo Olympic Games are underway, but the threat of COVID-19 already hampering events and the U.S. failing to medal on day one. The latest next on The Night Beat. To Tokyo now and the pandemic looming large of the start of the Olympic Games. That's right. The first women's beach volleyball match canceled due to a positive COVID test, but still the events are underway. ABC's Jane Longman is in Tokyo. Tonight, COVID continuing to impact the Tokyo Olympics as the first full day of the Games got underway. The first scheduled match for women's beach volleyball cancelled after the Czech team had to withdraw because of a positive test. New COVID cases in the Olympics rising yet again overnight to at least 127. One person testing positive in the Olympic Village, though officials say it's not an athlete. New cases also up 133% in the city of Tokyo over the last seven days, doing nothing to ease concerns across Japan that these games are causing a health emergency. This coming as the IOC issued a stern warning about breaches to COVID protocol after some athletes and officials were seen at the opening ceremony without masks. Still, despite the risks, the game's in full swing. The US men's gymnastic team advancing to the finals, landing in fourth place behind Japan, China and Russia. No fans, of course, but the squad had Simone Biles and the other U.S. women gymnasts to make up for it, cheering their support from the stands. Sam McCulloch, hoping to lead the young team to its first medal since 2008. Teammate Brody Malone, a first-time Olympian, saying before the event that the year-long delay to the Games gave him more time to prepare. It definitely helped me, for sure. You Having the year off just really gave me the time to get more numbers under my belt and get more confident. And a decision by the U.S. women's soccer team to skip the opening ceremony for practice appearing to pay off. Megan Rapino and the team bouncing back from that surprise loss to Sweden to dominate New Zealand 6-1. First Lady Jill Biden attending that match and Biden also joining French President Emmanuel Macron to take in a three-on-three -three basketball game, making its Olympic debut. While the United States ended the day disappointingly with zero medals, it was China who earned the distinction of being first to claim gold. Shooter Yang Chen taking first place in the women's 10-meter air rifle event. The 21-year-old putting the medal on herself because of COVID protocols. Happening around America as flames from California's Tamarack Fire continue to make their way into Nevada, some residents and rural communities have their bags packed, ready to evacuate. The blaze started by a lightning strike on the 4th of July is still burning out of control. It's now covered more than 65,000 acres and is only 4% contained. We saw some of our neighbors moving out some of their animals, some of their livestock and in preparation because that's the kind of stuff that takes a little bit longer. We hooked up to our camping trailer last night. So I've got some clothing items. I got a few jewelry items that are special to me. I um, wanted to make sure I took those with me. Um, toiletry things in both our bags, um, essential medications. 
At least 10 structures in California and Nevada have been destroyed. More than 1,400 fire officials are now assisting. One of California's most notorious serial killers died in prison today of natural causes. Rodney James Alcala, better known as the dating game killer, was 77 years old. Alcala had been on death row since 2010, having been convicted of the murders of five California women. He later pleaded guilty to the committing two murders in New York in the 70s and was also suspected of homicides in four other states. The nickname, the dating game killer, came from his appearance on the popular game show in 1978. Happening around the world, severe flooding in central China has left at least 56 people dead and at least five missing. That's according to a statement by Henan's province's emergency management department today, yesterday. The death toll can still possibly go up as rescue and cleanup operations continue. Heavy rainfall has infected more than 7.5 million people across of Henan since July 16th. Meanwhile, Typhoon Infa only expected to bring more rain to the region. A similar situation in India, at least 136 people reported dead after heavy rains battered the country's western coast over the past couple of days. 38 of those people died in a landslide on Thursday. The National Disaster Response Force, the Indian Army, Indian Coast Guards, Navy and Air Force have all been deployed for rescue operations. As of this morning, 90,000 people had been evacuated as the rain continued. Advanced tax credits for parents are finally going out, which means scammers are already trying to use them to take advantage, take to their advantage. Still ahead, the signs to look for. The first advanced tax credit payments to parents of children just went out and already scammers are at it. The IRS is warning families that imposters are trying to trick them out of valuable information. 12 on your side's Marilyn Moore. It's on the red flags that signal a fake. Families have already begun receiving the first of six monthly payments, up to $300 per child. Advances on their next child tax credit from Uncle Sam. Yeah, I'm very happy about it. And so are the scammers. The IRS is warning parents to be on the lookout for a variety of phone, email, text message, and social media scams targeting families eligible for the credit. You are almost a prime target for a scammer to say, we're going to trick them. We're going to trip them up and say, you're Credit's on the way, but we need more info for this next month. Click here. Jason Meza with the BBB says scammers are taking advantage of current events and posing as the IRS. Trying to get information, trying to get a line of credit from your bank. They're trying to get something out of you. The IRS says beware any communication offering to help you sign up for the credit or get it faster. To help you spot a fake, the IRS says it does not contact taxpayers by email, text, or social media to request information, does not leave recorded, urgent, or threatening messages, and does not ask for payment by gift card, wire, or cryptocurrency. The IRS is using 2019 and 2020 tax returns to automatically deliver these payments. Most people People don't have to do a thing. And you cannot get them any faster. If you do have questions about your child tax credit, go directly to irs.gov and look it up. As for those emails, text messages, and phone calls, hang up and delete. Marilyn Moritz, KSAT 12 News. Another look outside with live cam tonight. A toasty day. We've got another hot day in store tomorrow. So uh, go ahead and reclaim that cool spot by the pool or the lake or the river. If you were able to find it today, you'll need it again tomorrow. Over the past couple of weeks, we haven't been talking a lot about the tropics because things have been really quiet in the Atlantic Basin. Uh, thanks in part to the plumes of Saharan dust moving across the Atlantic that typically inhibits tropical development. But a little bit closer to home here, uh, off the east coast of Florida, there is a little area of unorganized shower and thunderstorm activity that the National Hurricane Center gives a 50% chance of becoming at least a tropical depression in the next two to five days. This is expected to stay a little bit closer to Florida and not expected to impact our forecast. We'll talk more about our local forecast coming up in just a couple of minutes. Stay with us. So I was outside today before the shows, mm -hmm. everybody, 
and it was hot. Yes. I needed the water in the Gatorade. Hey, yo, check this out, Katie. You ain't been hearing him, but he's been over here humming, Nelly's hot in here. <laughs> Every time he was hot in. <laughs> yes. That, yes, hot out there as well. Yes. Uh, man, now we're much more seasonable for this time of year. We were treated to below average temperatures through a good portion of the month thanks to rainfall and we needed every drop of it. We'll take what we can get. I shared these images on social media a couple days ago, and I think a lot of people were really shocked to see just how much our drought situation has improved over the last three months. So a good amount of time, uh, but this is really staggering here. So this is the drought monitor from uh, mid to late April. So three months ago, and at that time, 67% of the state was in drought as of this week only three percent of the state of texas is in drought so the really uh, the rainy patterns that we've had since april essentially off and on have been so beneficial not just for us here locally but also uh, elsewhere across the state things were looking pretty dire a few months ago and we find ourselves in a much better spot now uh, even july has been really good to us since the start of the month 4.38 inches of rain at the airport here in san antonio uh, that's above average by nearly two and a half inches and since the start of the year, we're up to nearly 22 inches of rain, and that's almost four inches above average. So we're doing really well in the rainfall department and those benefits reflected in the drought monitor. Now we are heading into a drier stretch of weather over the next seven days. Here's a look at our rainfall potential. Uh, pretty much a lack of any measurable rainfall over the next week or so. You'll see some of this green here, but that's essentially a tenth to a quarter inch of rain. A few lucky spots may get an isolated shower or storm at points next week, but we're not looking at any widespread really measurable rainfall over the next week or so. And that does have to do with our weather pattern. So this weekend, reason why it's just straight sunny and hot, we've got a weak area of upper level high pressure with us. I mentioned this last half hour. It's kind of like a mini heat high. It'll be with us again tomorrow, but by Monday, it's going to start to move off into the western part of the state and get suppressed a little bit. What that does for us is it opens the door, especially off to the east in the Gulf of Mexico, for a few very little weak rainmaking disturbances to move on through. That's these blobs of orange and red. That's good rainmaking energy or lift and that can help us out with rain chances and you'll notice as I run this through Tuesday into Wednesday even Thursday a few little of these blobs move on through but essentially they're just going to bring us isolated chances of rain as we get into Tuesday Wednesday and Thursday next week so not looking at any widespread rain and really I think for the most part what we'll see with those disturbances next week is mainly just an increase in high clouds so those thin uh, cirrus clouds we'll see a lot more of those roll in versus a whole lot of rain. Nonetheless, some isolated rain possible as we get into next week. But the focus really will be here uh, on the summertime heat, but this is where we should be this time of year. Our average high now is 96. We're gonna be very close to that as we get into next week, start of next weekend, so it's hot out there but nothing too crazy for this time of year. At this hour, 81 in New Braunfels, 77 in Fredericksburg, still 85 in Catula. Overnight, we'll see our temperatures drop down to the mid to upper 70s. We will pull in some low clouds through early tomorrow morning, but just like today, two, three hours of those low clouds and then they're gone and we're looking at abundant sunshine tomorrow afternoon. A little bit of a lingering haze. We'll have some lingering light Saharan dust for a couple more days. And then next week, here come those low end rain chances. Mainly though, just some good old South Texas summer sizzle. Guys. All right, Katie, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Well, just when you thought all of this was over when it came to conference <laughs> realignment, we have this bombshell from Texas and OU. Yeah, and it certainly feels like, as far as Texas and Oklahoma are concerned, it's a done deal for them wanting to go to the SEC. But the Big 12 is not going to go down without a fight. Plus, Booker, Holiday, and Middleton are now in Tokyo with Team USA. Coming up. Texas and 
Oklahoma appear to be SEC bound, but the Big 12 hasn't given up hope. Big 12 officials have discussed extra revenue shares of both schools as a way to entice them not to leave. The Big 12, as reported by CBS Sports, both schools are getting an additional half share, annually bumping their payments to approximately 56 million per year, and the other eight schools would decrease their payouts accordingly. Last season, payouts in the Big 12 averaged 37 million, so 56 mil is huge for UT and OU, and it's more than the approximate 45 and a half million dollars SEC schools received last season. A source familiar with the conversation told CBS Sports the revenue share idea was from the 50,000 foot level and is preliminary in nature. Texas and Oklahoma are expected to inform the Big 12 on Monday of their intentions to leave the conference. Meanwhile, Texas A&M Athletics Director Ross Bjork appears to have changed his stance on the possibility of Texas and Oklahoma joining the SEC. Earlier this week when the news broke, he certainly wasn't down with the Horns joining, but Bjork told the Houston Chronicle today, quote, We believe that throughout our time in the SEC, Texas A&M has become stronger than ever. The SEC is in position to lead. The college athletics landscape is changing and evolving. We know other people are interested interested in joining, that's not surprising. We feel in the state of Texas, we paved the way for that. We knew this day could happen and probably would happen. We're surprised at the speed of it, end quote. There are reports that the Aggies called a Monday meeting to discuss the issue. It's been a hectic week for Suns guard Devin Booker and an even crazier one for Bucks players Drew Holiday and Chris Middleton. Booker's been off since Tuesday night after the Suns lost to the Bucks in Game 6 of the NBA Finals. Middleton and Holiday took part in the Bucks championship celebration Thursday and then Friday morning they flew to Seattle to meet Booker and then the three took a private jet to Japan to join Team USA less than 24 hours before opening Olympic play with France. USA Basketball was kind enough to share the guys' arrival at 1.12 in the morning Tokyo time. Trip. Finally here. Uh, I'm ready to get going for sure. Yeah, I'm ready, man. Long flight, but we're here now. Right out in the morning. Here's Coach Pop giving Holiday a hug as he was there to greet all three of his guys. Team USA and France will play tomorrow morning at 8 local time. A very tough matchup for the Americans to start pool play. Pop indicated his plan is to play all three new arrivals in the game. UTSA hired Joey Ashley as assistant men's golf coach. He joins the Roadrunners from Texas State, where he was an assistant coach for four seasons. Ashley is married to U.S. Olympian and softball star Kat Osterman. They live in New Braunfels. She tweeted, my husband's making big moves, too. Now, Kat pitched six shutout innings today to help USA beat Mexico 2-0 to improve to 3-0 in pool play. I was tired this morning, as all y'all were. But there's no way I wasn't going to get up and get up here and help just because of Bryce his example for all of us. So thank y'all for being here. Have a great time and uh, stay bright strong. Birds up. Right. UTSA head football coach Jeff Trailer with some words before the inaugural Bryce Strong Walk Run Have Fun 5K held this morning at Judson High School. The race started on Bryce Wisdom Way. Mama Wisdom said 200 people signed up and that the support is amazing and overwhelming. Bryce Strong. Yeah, definitely great event. Good to see all those people out there. Larry. Yep. A group of veterinary students are hoping to ease the pain of losing a family pet. Tell me something good is next.